Find other great podcasts like this one at podmoth.network. Oh, hi. If you're looking for another spooky and funny podcast to add to your rotation, check out Anything Bones, now a part of the Podmoth Network. Hey, Boneheads, I'm Sophie Schwartz. And I'm Caitlin Hart. And we are the hosts of Anything Bones, the podcast where we talk about bones and bone-related topics. So, what are bone-related topics? Thank you for asking, Caitlin. This can be anything from mausoleums to murderers, famous skeletons to cadaver dogs. Bone churches, mummies, serial killers. You'll hear about them all. And sometimes we have guests stop by and tell us their favorite bony tales. Check out Anything Bones on Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, or wherever your little heart desires. We release new episodes every Saturday. Bone Voyage! Hey, what's up, you guys? Hey, what's up, you guys? I'm Catherine. And I'm Haley. And we are Saturdays for the Ghouls. A pod mod podcast. How are you, Haley? I'm good. How are you? I'm good too. Oh my god, I got a good from you. That's crazy. Yeah. I'm feeling good. I'm feeling like I got a good story to tell you today. Ooh. I'm excited. I hope so. Are you ready to jump into it, or do you have anything to tell the spooky bays before we, like, just hop on in? It's true crime. It's true crime week, and we're going to talk about a crime that happened. And it's kind of crazy, I would say. I like crazy. Uh, I think that by reading the title and by this first start off, I don't think you guys know what you're getting into. All right, so let's hop right into it then. The first person we're going to meet and we're going to talk about today is Mark James Kilroy. Say hello. He's walks it. No, I'm just kidding. I'd be like, oh, I don't know his part in the story. Yeah, we never know until it actually happens. Huh? Okay. He was born March 5th, 1968 in Chicago. Soon, him and his family moved to Santa Fe, Texas. He moved with his mom and his dad and his brother. His dad's name's James. Mom's name's Helen, and brother's name is Keith. The family was Catholic. He was very smart, athletic. I was like, can't relate. He was a Boy Scout. He was an honor student, and he was on the student council in high school. So that was pretty fun and snazzy. Uh, So pretty all-around kid. American white boy. Yep. American dream kid. What I said was he seemed like a preppy, popular boy. He was in high school in the 80s. So that's the vibe. Oh my God, he's the jock guy. He's Emilio Estevez from The Breakfast Club. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. He graduated in 1986 and he went to Southwest Texas University. Later, he transferred to Harleton State University on a basketball scholarship because, again, athletics... You can't relate. At Tarleton State, he joined Lamba Chi Alpha fraternity, and then he transferred to a major in pre-med. He wants to be a doctor, wants to help people. I'm trying to jump ahead of you because I'm like, this guy is like sports all-American boy turned bad. He wants to be a medical student, which means he's going to start like operating on people and doing some weird shit. That's how my brain is processing this right now. All-American boy. It's like the thing in the true crime where it says he was an all-American boy until he wasn't. And it just turns <laughs> black and white. Haley cannot tell if she's allowed to root for him or she should be scared of him. Well, let's just continue the story and see if that's still the vibe. That would be crazy if you guessed it, though. That would be. I'd be like, Spooky Babes, I promise you right now, I have no fucking idea who this man is and where the story is going. I keep her in the dark as much as possible because I feel like it's not fun if she knows everything. She guess when you guess, guys. I learn when you learn. Okay. Okay. 
pre-med. Pre-med, he's in college, he's doing great, he's doing fancy, right? Okay, so we're in 1989. So he's 21 years old. And we're just finishing up finals. He is very excited because it's March and he's finishing finals. And guess what happens after finals? Oh, spring break. Yeah. Okay. So it's Friday, March 10th, 1989. And and he just turned 21. He just turned 21. It's spring break, baby. He's He's ready to go. Ready for this shit. So ready. Okay. So Bradley, his bestie. He just turned 21. It was spring break. He was ready until he never came back. (laughs) He was ready for spring break. He was ready to murder. (laughs) Or he was ready for spring break, but the spring broke him. Sorry. (laughs) Let's keep it drunk. Okay. Bradley, his bestie. That's not from the article. It did say best friend, but I changed it. Bradley picked him up from his college and they set out to go to spring break. They went to Santa Fe and they picked up their other two friends, Bill. and So we have Bill, we have Brent, we have Bradley, and we have Mark. Don't you wish that Mark had a B name? I was just thinking, where's the Bark? Sorry. He's Bark. He's Bark for the rest of the time. The destination for spring break was South Padre Island, Texas. Do you want to know why that was the destination for spring break? Basketball. Bitches. Bad bitches. You'll find out. Okay, so South Padre Island, Texas is drivable to the border of Mexico. Okay. So they're going to be able to like drive on down to the border, walk across the border, walk back, drive back. That's the route that they've taken on this trip a couple times. You'll find out. So they arrive at the hotel, which is a a Sheraton hotel and resort. So it's on the beach. There's like a beach behind the hotel. They arrive just before midnight and they crash. They crash for the night and they're like, tomorrow, spring break begins. Okay. I don't know why they sound like that, but in my head, that's what they sound like. Tomorrow, boys, we party. You know, and then I feel bad because this is literally going to end bad and we're I'm making jokes. If we're going to make jokes, it has to be now. Yeah. There's no it's time about to make jokes later. No. <laughs> uh, but you don't know who you're going to be sad for. Is it Bradley? Is it Bill? Is it Mauer? <laughs> I forgot the other B name. Sorry. It's Brent. Okay. So on this weekend through the like five week spring break period, this island filled with thousands of students to celebrate spring break. It was a very typical spring break location for people who live in Texas or near Texas. There's beer, partying, island events, you know, all those things that you see on like spring break MTV, like that stuff was happening in this place. Just to give you like a little set the scene. Every day they're going out. That's the shit that they're doing. They're like hanging out, going to wet t-shirt contest, blah, 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 blah. Right. So Piranha. Piranha 3D, baby. With the party scenes. Yes. 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 Okay. Saturday, they wake up. Mark and Bradley call home and they're like, hey, just want to let you know we got to South Padre Island. We're doing great. Love you. Bye. Hang up. That evening, they met a few girls from Purdue University, and they partied all night till the morning. So Sunday, Mark and his friends wake up, and they go to the beach, and they're like, what do we want to do today, boys? So they suntan. They're tanning at the beach in the morning, because that's the best time to tan. UV's not high. They didn't know that. But anyway, after suntanning and hanging out at the beach, they went to lunch, Afterward, they went to back to the hotel where there was a Miss Tanline contest, and they went to go see that contest at the hotel. They decided to go back to the hotel room after that. They took a little nap or like a little, you know, a, a relaxing. And they, they woke up that night, and they took their first trip down to Mexico. They stopped at a Sonic before they, they took the whole drive to have dinner. And they met a group of girls from University of Kansas who were also on their way down to Mexico. 
So the girls oh, followed them in their car down to the border and they all got out and walked across the border together. This is before like the border was like locked down. Yeah. <laughs> the girls from the University of Kansas and the boys went and partied at this nightclub called Sergeant Peppers. And they, at that nightclub is where they parted ways with the girls. They didn't like continue hanging out. Uh, basically, when everything started closing down, like the bars, they headed back to South Padre Island to their hotel because in the morning they woke up in their hotel and they went down and had another Miss Tan Line contest. <laughs> now, I don't understand exactly what a Miss Tan Line contest is. I understand it's probably like a wet t-shirt contest. I, I don't quite know what it means. It was just like, oh, my God, look at my boobs that are like five shades lighter than the rest of my body. Yeah, are girls just flashing people? I, like, I didn't understand. It's the 80s, bro. You never know. Okay. So later that day, Mark actually met up with one of his former fraternity brothers at a condo party that he was hosting. And around 1030, he came back and they went back to the border and crossed again to Matamoros, which is the city that's right on the other side of the border. And this city was flooded th this evening with, like, at least 15,000 spring breakers. Oh, my God. Like, the bars were full, the bars were packed, the streets were packed, full. Everyone was drunk and all over the place. So, <clears throat> it's a no from me, dog. It's a no from me. And the other, the, I mean, the reason why a lot of spring breakers went down to Mexico, and they still do, is because the legal drinking age is 18. And people of all ages in college can drink down there instead of just 21 else. Mark could drink in the United States, but not everyone could. So when they were trying to pick a bar, they were like, which bar has the shortest line? And they picked that bar. And that was Los Sombreros. Had the shortest line. So they got in, they went in, and they had a few drinks, and then they left the bar. And they went and walked to this other bar called London Pub. This bar was, at the time, rebranded as like a hard rock cafe for just like the spring break time. But this bar was rowdy as fuck. And Mark wandered off and met a few women and lost track of his friends. Around 2 a.m., all the boys were like, we should go back to the hotel, get into our beds and be snug as a bug in a rug. So... They went outside and they found Mark talking to this girl from one of the Miss Tanline contests. But they all decided to walk to the border. And the girl was like following with him and like talking to him still. But because of the fact that the sidewalk in the street was so crowded, the boys kind of got separated. So Bradley and Brent were walking ahead and they stopped at this restaurant called Garcia's, which is literally right on the other side of the border. It's like border Garcia's. So he was like, we're wait here for Brent and um, Mark to get back. Um, Mark sat on a stoop of someone's house and talked to the girl while he was waiting for Bill to catch up. And they said their goodbyes. I'm sure it was very lovely to meet her. And Bill was like, hey, I got to pee. Wait for me. So Mark waited. Bill went into like the side of the road or something, peed. And when he turned around, he didn't see Mark anywhere. So he was like, oh, maybe he's just up ahead. So he walked to Garcia's to meet up with Bradley and Brent. And Mark wasn't with Bradley and Brent. So they went back down to look and see if Mark was around, but they couldn't find him. So they waited a few more minutes and then they were like, he, maybe he just hitched a ride with the girl back up to the hotel. So they went back to the hotel. Mark wasn't at the hotel. When they woke up and Mark still wasn't around and he still wasn't at the hotel, they contacted the police to report him missing. Oh, Mark, no. I know. It was the B-boys the whole time. They were like, get rid of Mark. He's not a B-boy. Just kidding. The search began. Generally, during spring break, if a student goes is reported missing, they pop up a few days later with a hot hangover and loss of memory you know like they just had a little too much to drink somewhere crashed and found their way back home in fact within the last three months 
Mark was one of 60 people who had went missing in Matamoros. So Mark's uncle works in U.S. Customs, and he got a hold of this case. He got he heard about it through the grapevine. And because of that, this whole case got a lot more publicity than any other missing persons case. So his uncle gathered like a police task force to begin to look for Mark. Both Mexican police and the U.S. police questioned people about that night. Both suspected there potentially was some foul play. They thought that maybe he was a victim of a robbery or maybe a drug crime. And they retraced the steps with the best friends. So they basically took them everywhere they went. When they came up with absolutely nothing, the authorities hired a hypnotist to come up with some clues of where Mark might have been. Because hypnotists obviously would work, I guess. The hypnotist hypnotized Bradley. Bradley mentioned that he remembers a young man with a blue plaid shirt and a scar on his face talking to Mark that night. And he said something along the lines of, hey, don't I know you from somewhere? The authorities decided from all these interviews with like the hypnotist that he was probably kidnapped for a robbery and that his body was potentially dumped somewhere in a remote location. So they had helicopters and terrain vehicles from the border start searching very remote areas like around the border. His parents traveled down to Mexico and started passing out flyers that offered a $15,000 reward for anyone who could help find Mark. And the U.S. authorities felt, right? (laughs) The U.S. authorities felt as though maybe the Mexican police were, uh, although they were helpful, there was some sort of delay or they were slow to share information. So they thought that there was potentially someone involved in the disappearance in the police department. But they didn't know that for sure. But they thought that it was kind of, when they were getting pieces, it was like days later and every second counts in a missing persons case. Mm -hmm. On March 26th, which was just about 16 days later, maybe less, his case was put on America's Most Wanted, but... Any of the leads that were generated never came to fruition for that. The parents returned to Texas and withdrew him from college at that point. On April 1st, the Mexican police were monitoring a drug checkpoint. So basically at a drug checkpoint, I don't know if anyone, maybe you don't know, is that they stop all the cars and they like look in your car at the drug tech checkpoint and then they let you go or they pull you over and arrest you. I mean, I'm essentially... I've never been in one, but essentially that's what they do. But one of the cars that was shot on the drug checkpoint drove through a roadblock and sped away, which I'm not going to lie, is a little suspicious. A little bit. Yeah. I mean, play it cool. Anyway, so instead of lights ablaze in following that car, they had an unmarked police car follow that guy to wherever he went. And he went to Santa Elena Ranch, which is right outside of Matamoros, which is the city right across the border that Mark went missing from. He pulled in, and after 30 minutes, the driver decided to leave and back off and go again. So the police decided to investigate this ranch because they hadn't yet. It hadn't been on their radar, but now it was. So through a search at this ranch, they found marijuana traces, and cult paraphernalia. The driver of the car was Serafin Hernandez Garcia, who was the nephew of a local drug lord. They decided not to arrest him at that point, but they decided to follow him because they assumed where he goes, we find more. You know what I mean? So through this search, they uncovered many family activities, quote, that happened at this ranch. On April 9th, Serafin Hernandez Garcia, his uncle, Elio Hernandez Rivera, David Sanero Valdez, Sergio Martinez Salinas, Domingo Reyes Bustamante, who was a ranch caretaker, were all arrested at the ranch. And while they were detained, they were like pretty calm. They were not like stressed. They didn't seem like they were worried at all. And... While they were detained, they interviewed another caretaker that was on the property still. That person 
told the police that there were many visitors from the Seraphin criminal group who often visited this ranch. They also identified Mark from the photo saying, quote, yeah, I saw him, and then pointed towards a shack on the ranch. While being interrogated, Seraphin, who was the driver, he confessed that Mark and many other white men were killed on that ranch. And it was ordered by Adolfo Costanzo, who was their cult leader. Adolfo practiced human sacrifice, believing that it was going to protect him and his drug business and all of the people who worked for him. It was going to prevent them from being hurt. It was going to prevent them from being arrested. It was going to prevent them from being, you know, any kind of bad things happening to him and his posse, per se. As for Mark, the gang actually mingled through spring break festivities and they saw Mark and they lured him to the truck and they basically wrestled him into the car. And at one point he broke free and started running away and he was intercepted by another car and they handcuffed him and put him in the back of that car. They drove him to the ranch and they left him in the car overnight. In the morning, one of the caretakers gave him food and drink and 12 hours after he was taken, they decided to duct tape his face and mouth and walked him to the shack on the property. Throughout the night, they did like so such terrible things to this man. They tortured him and they sodomized him and he was led outside and used a machete and chopped him in the back of the neck. It didn't necessarily behead him, but it did sever his spinal cord. They took his brain and they boiled it in a pot that's used to boil animal remains and human remains, I guess. In this case, they chopped off his legs only to simplify the bur burials, what they said. It wasn't for any other reason but to simplify how they had to bury him. And then they inserted a wire up his spinal column so that when he was done decomposing, they could grab the wire and pull the whole set of bones out of the ground. So they buried him with both wire ends sticking up out of the ground so that they could see where the, he was located and when they had to go back and look for him. When they retrieved the bones, the cult members would wear them around their necks to fend off danger and other bad things that could happen to them. Ailey's just staring into the black abyss now. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Ailey. It's okay. <laughs> I told you this was crazy. Mark, I'm sorry. Mark, we okay. really are sorry. Okay. On a April 11th, the police forced all of the cult members to go and exhume any of the bodies that were currently on the property. They found oh, 15, 15 bodies of men who were killed over the last nine months. Three of the 15 were never identified. Most of them were rival gang members from other gangs that were obviously murdered on that land. The other things that they found, along with the 15 men, were... 243 pounds of weed, 108 grams of coke, 12 firearms, and 11 vehicles, which they all seized and took. And as soon as Adolfo knew anything about this, he left town. He just zooped on out there with a few choice people. And he left with Sarah Aldrit. I think that's how you say her name. Martin Quintina Rodriguez. There's a lot of names. I'm so sorry if I pronounce any of them. And Adolfo went to an apartment that he had that was like just out of town. It's like a town over from where they were. And so at that point, the manhunt began for Adolfo because he's the ringleader, the cult leader, the head honcho. And if he goes down, everyone else does too. So they got rumored that maybe he was in Miami with his mom. They had rumors where he was maybe in Chicago and they went there. It was also rumored that he said that he's going to go kidnap a bunch of kids from every school, one for every person who was jailed and a cult member because there are currently people who are being held. 
and I don't know the the truth of all of these or what they were. As far as I know, these were all rumors. There were many other rumors about kind of where he was located, but everything kind of led to a dead end. Authorities said that Adolfo was, quote, extremely dangerous and that he was last seen driving a Mercedes Benz in Brownsville. So they went to Brownsville and they raided Sarah, who went with him. They raided her house and they discovered, quote, an altar and several religious images. They also stated that the house's interior was covered with blood. She was indicted for aggravated kidnapping at that point because they weren't sure where she was either. All the cult members that were in possession and out were indicted with so many different charges related to drug possession and drug dis- distribution that there were honestly too many for me to like list. We'd be here all day, to be honest. On April 12th, there was a press conference with um, the people who were currently being held and journalists. And this is what they found. They said that Elio, who was the uncle, was known as like the executioner and that many of the members had like these scars on their shoulders, their backs, their arms, their chest, and that these were supposedly marks that were given to members who were allowed to perform the human sacrifices in the cult, which scroll it back to the hypnotist who Bradley said that he saw a guy with scars on his face talking to Mark that night. (laughs) I don't know if there's anything there because there was never like pinpointed that was true but that's kind of crazy that all these guys have scars and that's who he saw in his i don't know what's that called subconscious or whatever that's yeah called. so on april 13th was originally going to be like a event for mark to you know hope that he comes back and hope that everything's good but it turned into mark's memorial unfortunately cool well Hundred people attended Mark's memorial. I don't think twelve hundred people even know me, let alone would attend my funeral. That's crazy. But anyway, his friends say that they wish that they had just stayed in Texas instead of going over the border. And his father said that he wasn't angry, but he hoped that his that his son's killers would go to heaven and apologize to Mark for the wrongdoings against him. And his mother said that she wanted people to pray for the people who killed her son. Which the mother and father are like so much well more well adjusted than I am. Oh yeah. The way that I would be like causing a fucking ruckus, I can't I can't imagine. I can't imagine how much it takes for you to be like, you know what, you should pray for the killers. I even I wouldn't be able to be like, you know what, pray for them. Like that calm state of mind. Yeah. Um, It's crazy. But they're better people than we are, I guess. (laughs) Two weeks later, the police on national television burned down the shack that was on that ranch. And they said, we knew that this was important to Adolfo. And we wanted to hit him where it hurt and hope that maybe he came out of hiding. But nothing came out of that. I'm just like, I feel like you're getting toward the end. And I'm like, did they not catch this motherfucker? But I'll wait. The authorities met with witchcraft practitioners and sorcerers. This is the authorities are meeting with witchcraft practitioners and sorcerers to try to find this man. They're not dropping this fucking manhunt. Thank goodness. So they found that Adolfo was probably hiding. I don't know how these these people helped them find he was hiding in this town and the town is i don't want to butcher the name so i'm just not going to say it but i could spell it for you if anyone (laughs) knows how to say it you can say it c-u-a-u-h-t-e-m-o-c they searched they began searching everywhere in that town interrogating people they were just they were going to the grocery store the shoemakers like everywhere in this town they were searching for that man and they went to the grocery store and they saw someone buying a exorbitant amount of food using U.S. money. And so they followed him. He wasn't Adolfo, so they didn't know who he was. 
suspicious, but it was very suspicious. So they decided to follow him to where he was. And he led them right to this little apartment building that they found out that's where Adolfo was staying. And this man was one of the men who left with him, Alvaro de Leon. And so on May 6th of 89, the police surrounded the building that Adolfo was in. And from the apartment, he could see them all surrounding the building. And he started shooting at them from the ground level or whoever was on the ground level. He started shooting at them out the window. And then he was he began throwing, quote, gold coins and paper money out the window. And then he was burning money on the stove. I don't know what he was thinking. Throwing the money out doesn't make him not actually have the money. I don't know. Anyway, after 45 minutes of like chaos and fighting with the police, he told the Leon that he wanted him to kill him. That he wanted him to kill him and Quintina Rodriguez, which is the other, which is one of the other men who came with him. And he was obviously really hesitant about completing that demand from him. But Costanzo or Adolfo hit him in the face and told him that he would suffer in hell if he did not obey him. So De Leon, quote, stood in front of them and opened fire and killed them both with a machine gun inside of a closet. So the police at that point entered the apartment, and De Leon and Sarah, along with a few others that had been with Adolfo, were arrested and questioned later. And they said, you know, recently Adolfo had just lost his mind. And I was thinking, like, recently? This man was doing human sacrifices. Like, recently he lost his mind? You're telling me that... Before he was of sound mind when he was making human sacrifices? Come on now. He's been crazy for decades. Anyway, the police were worried, thinking that Adolfo had, like, faked his death because he did this whole thing, like, kill me, like, in front of the police. But they verified with fingerprints that the corpse that they brought back was, in fact, Adolfo. And he was dead. Anyway, De Leon was sentenced to 30 years for killing Adolfo and Quintana Rodriguez. Sarah was sentenced to 62 years in prison. And then other cult members, Elio, Stefan, or sorry, Elio, Serafin, Martinez, and Serna, they all received 67 years each. And their charges were, quote, multiple homicide, possession of narcotics, involvement in organized crime, police impersonation, illegal body des- desecration, illegal possession of firearms, and illegal possession of weapons exclusive to the Mexican armed forces. And if they're still alive, they're still in jail right now. Now, the people who got 67 years, their sentences did get taken down to 50 years, but that's that's like, uh, it was some sort of like, it wasn't because of good behavior or anything like that. I, I believe it was something along the lines of like, they're only allowed to get up to 50 years or like 50 years is basically life. Like, I don't, I don't really understand exactly why that was, but that's the punishment for the crime for the cult members. But on the very right end of the spectrum, if you want to have a silver lining, Mark Kilroy's parents created a foundation in honor of Mark. And the foundation is obviously called the Mark Kilroy Foundation. And it quote, promotes drug awareness, education, and prevention through this Just Say No campaign. And through this program, quote, full-time and part-time counselors visit school campuses during the academic year in Santa Fe and in Hitchcock, and they hold programs for approximately 800 students regularly. When the students are gone for the summer, the foundation conducts programs in summer camps by partnering with volunteers, and they offer free outdoor activities like archery, golf, fishing, tennis, and swimming with an average of 150 youth that participate in these programs every summer. So, I mean, they did that because Mark always wanted to be a doctor and they always wanted to help people. And so they were able to do that for him after he passed, which was really nice. I mean, it's obviously a shame that he did pass, but it, he's still helping people even though is no longer with 
And that's the story of Mark Kelvin. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't read the making. Uh, it's okay. Oh, this is like an episode of CSI, I swear. Someone is kidnapped by a cult. I was hoping while I was reading it that Mark was still alive and that he was just safe with the cult. I know. It was also said that Adolfo was at least bisexual because, you know, he, the person that was killed with him was rumored to potentially have been his lover and that Sarah was also his lover. But that was all rumored. So I decided to like <laughs> not include it in the story because I wasn't sure about the truth of the matter. Well, I'm so sorry that's such a sad story. Unfortunately, basically, all true crimes are sad stories for the most part, unless, I mean, even the, even like the ones where people survive are better, but they're not good. Yeah. So it's hard. It's hard to do. So yeah, that's what was wild. Yeah. It was good. It was sad, but it was good. I think. There may be a documentary about it. I was honestly looking for one, but I couldn't find one. But I think that I saw something about maybe Netflix had one, but Yeah, that's what I was saying. I could not find anything on YouTube except for other people doing this like same thing that I was doing. And I refuse to like listen to someone else's podcast to get more information about my podcast. So like I strictly stick to like Wikipedia, Murderpedia, news articles to collect my own information. There's a documentary on Max if I didn't give you a good enough image. It probably actually deep dives a little more into like the cult and the Adolfo. Well, thank you, Catherine, for bringing us that chilling tale. Terribly sad, unfathomable tale, Mark Kilroy. Yeah. Me and Catherine don't sound happy or enthusiastic at all. Uh, it's horrible. After researching it for hours and then having to retell it to someone else and then accidentally seeing them like break. You feel that's so sad. Like literally. Okay. I feel like this is the first time I've told you a story that you just start like staring off into space. Like, like after I told you something. I don't know. It was the S word for me. Yeah. I was like, hi. Yeah. And the wire was awful too. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'd never heard of that ever happening anywhere, ever in my entire career of listening to true crime documentaries. I've never, have never seen that anywhere. If you had any kind of means, you could always donate to Mark Kilroy's foundation if that was something that was moving you. And that could always help students and other people to learn the dangers of drugs and hopefully keep them out of drug areas. That's something you could do. That's a positive from here. Haley, would you yep. like some fun animal facts? I would love some. I just thought maybe we needed to break the tension with some funny animal facts. Okay. Ostriches' eyes are bigger than their brain. That's why they are so derpy. Yeah. Polar bears are not white. Their fur is actually transparent. Really? That's weird. Mm -hmm. So the glass. No. That's, that's not how that works. That's not that's their glass. glass. And I'm like, no. And she's like, glass. They're glass. <laughs> polar, polar bears are now glass. You heard it here first, folks. Mm -hmm. The only animal in the world that cannot jump are elephants. They can't get off. They too big. Is it because they don't have knees? Nope. They too big. I don't know why. They uh, just <laughs> too big. They could jump if they wanted to. No, they can't. They could do a little front back jump, but they can't all fours and they can't. That's sad. Okay, wait, sorry. No <laughs> sad ones. A crocodile can't stick his tongue out. Can you imagine a crocodile just going yeah. Pandas love to be alone. Panda, I know. And 
horses are capable of seeing nearly 360 degrees at one time. <laughs> oh my God. They're just like, 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 oh my gosh, that means that they can see you sitting on them behind them. Like, they're like, oh my God. You know those videos where people put that like camera in their mouth? Yes. That's the horse's eyes sight, probably. <laughs> yeah. Let's see. Are there any other fun facts? Hippo's sweat is pink. Oh, that's mm-hmm. weird. weird. <laughs> that's terrifying. They just look like Pepto Bismol. <laughs> a jellyfish and a cucumber are both 95% water. Crazy. Funny story this morning. I was driving out here to my appointment. And on, like, the side of the road, there was, like, this embankment and, like, a bunch of trees. And all of a sudden, I just saw this, like, thing come down. And I just saw, like, like flapping. And it just, like, fell off the embankment into, like, this ditch. And I was like, oh, it's, like, a crow or something. It was a fucking chicken. There was just a chicken in the road. And I was like, insert joke here. Wow. I should I should have been like, sir, sir, why did you cross the road today? <laughs> oh. And you know what? Humans blink four million two hundred thousand times a year. You know what I think would be so funny is I think we should do an episode where we do like, are you smarter than a fifth grader? Well, I already know the answer is no. Yeah, but that was that's the funny part. Do you have anything to tell us spooky guys before we leave? Spooky Banks. I don't know. Okay. Peace out. Girl Scout. Thanks for joining us today. Sorry it was fucking sad. But it's true crime is a hard topic anyway. So it's we try to make it as light as possible. Catherine is now doing animal facts, which is great. Love that. We love you guys. Well, thank you guys for joining us. I know it was a hard one, as most true crime weeks end up being. We appreciate you so much. You know what? Money's not real. Nothing's real. Go have a little treat. Tell anyone who has a question about it. We said you could. Okay. And we hope that your mental health is good today and the rest of this week. And until we see you next time, protect your headspace. And don't do anything that's going to try to ruin your headspace. And the world's a better place with you in it. And we are, we love you and we will see you in your nightmares.